we're live. Hello, everybody. I'm Sophie Liu, and I am very excited to be here with my fellow TA, Leo. Um, I think you need to talk to show up on the screen, Leo. Oh, hello, everyone. Yes. Um, I'm very excited to be with Sophie today. And I just wanted to introduce Sophie really fast. Sophie is a really amazing person, and she's also extremely smart because she qualified for MOP in 2022 and also received the bronze medal in the USAMO. But she also loves to dance and write. Yay! Um, yeah, I would also like to introduce Leo because I didn't actually say why he's so very awesome. Oh, Leo. Leo is a three-time Amy qualifier, which is really cool because Amy is like big-brained. And he also qualified for national astronomy competition twice, which I find just very cool because like my brain cannot fit all of the information about stars and stuff inside this, you know, this space. He also qualified for FBLA Nationals. I'm not actually sure what that is because um, I am not educated about various competitions like that, but it sounds very cool. He also loves math and is very excited to teach all of y'all. So let's get started. Leah, what do we start with today? Okay, to get started, we're starting with problem 21 on the math counts, um, 2023 math count state level sprint. And the question reads, let X be equal to this huge number, like 352 million, A, B, C, then 0, 5, 2, where A and B, A, B, and C represent digits that are not necessarily distinct. How many order triples A, B, and C exist for which X is divisible by 44? So for this problem, since what well, we can notice here that 44, that is equal to 11 times 4. And does, well, for the visibility rule by 4, you only have to look at the last two digits of a number. And the last two digits of this huge X value is just 52. And because 52 is divisible by 4, and that e any equals um, 13, it's already divisible by 4. So you just need to check for divisibility by 11. And we need to find all order triples A, B, and C that satisfy that. Um, and the reason why divisibility by 4 works this way is because, like, if you write out a number, like, let's say, like, um, 384, this equals 300 plus 80 plus 4, but like 100 is divisible by 4 already, so anything above like the 100 digit is already divisible by 4. So we don't only need to worry about last two digits, just a like quick side note. And okay, so now divisibility by 11 works like this. We actually add the alternating digits, like, well, we see that 3 plus 2 plus b plus 0 plus 2, this has to equal 5 plus a plus c plus, um, wait, 5 plus a plus c plus 5. And this means that, um, this means that, B plus 2 equals A plus C plus 5. And A plus C um, plus 3 equals B. And since A, B, and C are all digits from 0 to 9, we just need to find number triples such that this works. So... Um, hmm. yeah, so B can range from three, four, all the way to nine. And notice that when B is three, A plus C is zero. So there's only one order triple such that that works. And I'm going to like kind of scroll down right now. Um, 
Yeah. So there's one way for a, a plus c to be equal to zero. Oh, wait, that's one actually. Um, and then when b equals two a plus c, it can be a can be one plus zero or zero plus one. So that's two ways. And this goes all the way up till six. I mean, a plus c equals six, so that is seven ways. So it should be equal to twenty eight, if I'm not mistaken. I don't see any do can we see comments like on chat? Um I think you might oh, have it's right the, here. Yeah. Wait, do I have you might it not on? have the chat relay up link oh, up snap. on your screen? Um well if I had to add that beforehand, okay. Wait, what is it? Um I'll send it to you okay. after this question. Yeah. And let me check the answer. Oh wait, that's wrong. Never mind. I did something wrong. Um wait. It's not twenty-eight. Three plus two plus two plus two. That equals five plus a plus c plus five. And wait, what? I think it might be because you have like mod mod issues, because we know that a plus c plus three is equal to b mod eleven. Oh wait, um, snap! You're right. You're right. You're right. Okay. Yeah, I, that's why I messed up. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, and you uh, were thinking just like without mod eleven. That's right. That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah, that's why I messed up. Yeah, you're right. Um. Okay. So basically, they have to be equivalent mod eleven. Yeah, so a b plus two equals a plus is equivalent to a plus c plus five mod eleven. And this means that b is equivalent to a plus c plus three mod eleven. So this means that um um real quick, Jasper yeah. was asking what mod eleven is. Basically, okay. mod 11 is just, it just means that if you have two things equal to mod, each other mod 11, they just have the same remainder when you divide by 11. So the difference is a multiple of 11. It's like a fancy way of just saying what you know about this problem, which is the difference is divisible by 11, if that makes sense. Because writing out it's divisible by 11 is like it's kind of hard to write out every time you want to say something or every time you want to write a math problem so instead a lot of people use or instead we've introduced this mod 11 sort of format to teach you or to it's sort of like shorthand or um you know plus or minus signs that make it easier to sort of express your ideas in math yeah yeah right. that's exactly Can right yeah great explanation um, so ba basically here we have many cases. So as I was saying before, uh, B directly can equal A plus C plus three, and this gives us 28 cases. Or B plus 11 can equal A plus C plus three. Um, B minus 11 equals A plus C plus three. And I think for B plus 22, that's not really possible. Wait, is it possible? Let me try. B plus 22 and then B minus 22 equals A plus C plus 3. B minus 22 equals A plus C plus 3. When B plus 22 equals A plus C plus 3, um, wait, that's not possible because then the left side becomes a b plus 19, but the maximum of a plus c is 18. So this is not possible. When it's a plus c plus, yeah, that's not possible either, obviously. Um, so we have these three cases, and when 
be when 22 becomes like 33 or 44 or 55 it's like doesn't work either because it's way too big so we can check for b plus 11 equals a plus c plus 3 that means that um um well i can scroll down more this means that B equals A plus C minus 8. And so B can be, B can be, B can be 0 through 9. And then A plus C has what we at what we has when b equals zero a plus c has uh wait that is it can't be zero no no actually wait it can yeah it can when b equals zero a plus c is eight and that means that it has nine options when b equals one it's ten then you add nine because when B equals two, it's A plus C is ten. So it's A can go from one to nine, and C has to go from nine nine to one. And then you add eight plus seven all the way to you add when B equals nine, A plus C is seventeen. So that is two. And then finally, when we use there's this case, this case, and this case, and the third case. When B minus 11 equals A plus C plus 3. Um, B equals A plus C plus 14. And when... Wait. Wait, this is not possible either, I think. Because... Yeah, this is not possible. So we add up these cases, and this adds up to, um, so one one plus two plus three plus four all the way to ten equals fifty five because it's ten times eleven over two, and that's minus one because there's no one here plus nine. This equals um. 63 plus 28 is equal to 91. Okay, that, that's good. Finally, we got the answer. 91 should be the right answer. Great. Yep, okay. On to question number 22. That took longer than expected. <laughs> Great job. Um, yeah, you could also do it just listing it out this way instead. So like sort of basing it off of cases of when B equals zero through nine. And um, that might be easier, that might be harder. It's up to you to pick which one is that, which one you are more comfortable with. Yeah, so the overall, the overall idea though is just that this number is already divisible by four because it ends in 52. So we only have to worry about mod 11 or whether it's divisible by 11. All right, next problem, problem 22. Is it really long? This one is a really long winded wood problem. So I will just um, basically paraphrase it so that you don't all have to read this, you know, probably 200 words. So the idea is that you have these four cards and the front consists of 9, B, A, or 7, and the back consists of M, S, A, and 2. And you sort of like randomly assign these back values to the front values. And we want to find the probability that when you randomly assign these back values to the front values, um, the A sort of never matches with A, or any of these A's don't match with another letter on the other side. So what I mean by that is it says, if a card has a letter written on one side, then the letter A is not written on the other side of the card. What this piece of um, text means is that if a card has a letter, then A can't be on the other side. So A can't match with any letter, basically. So 
What that means is, for example, if you have、um, A on the front and S on the back, that would be bad because then a, this card has a letter written on one side, but A is on the other side. This is、um, very bad. If we, on the other hand, had something like A and A, this is also bad because you know A is a letter and the other side of A is also A. So this is also bad. So we want to just figure out how we can rearrange these letters to get this good case, get these good cases. All right, let's get into it.、Um, I see a lot of like one fourths and one halves in the answer choice. In sorry, the chat relay. I think you you guys are sort of trying to multiply a's with, like the fact that there's only one a over here and one a over here to get an answer really quickly. And I like that you guys are trying to do that, but. This context, I mean, this question is a bit more complicated than that. Okay, so we've got the front is nine b a and seven. So let's just imagine we had the cards with nine b a and seven just laid out in front of us, and we're just assigning the back values to each of these cards. So notice that the only thing that can be the, on the back of a. Is going to be the two because if you have M on the back, that's a letter on the back of A. So is S and so is A. So only two is going to be allowed to be on the back of A. So we have used that one now.、Um, and then let's look at where A can be placed because basically the restriction, the only restriction we're given is all of, is placed on the A's. So if we can figure out how to place the A's, we will be golden. So this A has to be on nine or seven because it's got to be part of the or on the other side of a number rather than a letter. So that means we either have two here and A over here, or you have two here and A over here. So now we've got two cases. Now we only have the letters M and S left. And notice that there's also no A's left, so there's not really any restrictions left again. Oh, Sophia asked,、uh, and Jasper asked, "Can we read the question again?"、Um, yeah, here. I'll just paste this book over here, actually. So the idea that I was getting at just now was that、um, because it says if a card has a letter written on one side, then the letter is not, then the letter A is not written on the other side. So the back of these nine B and A, nine B A and seven cards has to be. Well, A has to be on. Not sorry, two has to be on this A because otherwise a letter is on A, so two is here. And then, like I said earlier, that means that either、um, the A is either going to be on the nine or the seven because there's only really two non-letter options. So if two is here, then either A is here, or A is here. And then notice that M and S don't have any restrictions left, so you can either have M and S like this, or M and S like this. So basically, each of these two cases are going to give you two answers. So that gives you two times two, which is four cases. Oops, sorry, two times two is four total cases that work. Meanwhile, the total cases that we actually have is going to be. Oh, Jasper asked, what if A is at the back of B? We're not allowed to have that because then the card has the card that has the letter B has the letter A on the back, which sort of contradicts this statement. Anyway, so we have two times two equals four total methods that work and follow this true statement. Divide by the total ways we could have arranged these cards is well, it's going to be four factorial because there's four different. Possible backs that we could have assigned to the fronts. So two times two equals four divided by four factorial. That's going to be well, four factorial is just four times six, so that's one sixth. Yeah. Great explanation. Okay, so now we can move on to question number twenty-three. Um. Okay, so twenty-three is quite tricky, actually. But it does say the line L passes through the point eight comma one eleven, and the smaller angle formed by the line L and the line Y equals X measures thirty one degrees. 
what is the greatest possible degree measure of the smaller angle formed between the line L and line Y equals X square root of three? Oh, snap. I thought there was a diagram somewhere, but never mind. Um, so for this problem, I actually want to first draw the line Y equals X and the y line Y equals X square root of three in order to kind of like um, better visualize this problem. Oh, Sophia asks, is Professor Lowe joining? Uh, he's actually not going to be here today, I think, because um, he's like, uh, he has something that's coming up. But anyways, when we have a graph like here, and we have like a line y equals x, it looks like this. And then the we want, we care about the angle right now. So the angle between the x axis and this is actually 45 degrees. And then when when we have a line y equals square x square root of three, it kind of it sort of looks like this. And this thing right here is 15 degrees. And the reason why this is true is because if we have a, well, when we have a one root three by two root th one root three triangle, because we plug in one equals x, y equals root three, and then the hypotenuse is two, this angle right here is 60 degrees, because that's a, um, like a kind of like an equilateral triangle split in half. Okay, so we know now, now we know this, but then we know that we have a line L that passes through, that, I mean, that forms the angle with the line Y equals X that measures 31 degrees. So we kind of have like a, we have the line, y, line Y equals X, we're rotating it 31 degrees to form line L. And actually, it turns out that the, the point, the fact that it passes to the point 8, 11 doesn't really matter here because there's only two possible angles that get formed. Um, yeah. So basically, when it's 31 degrees, it can be like this. And then this angle right here is 31 degrees. So that means that this angle right here, because you're adding 15 to 31 degrees to get this angle here between the root 3, y equals x root 3, and the line L, that gives you 46 degrees. But notice there's another case here, but it turns out the other case actually does not work because it's actually, um, it's a smaller angle than the 46 degrees. The other case looks like, um, like this. Wait, I'll draw that better. So this is 31 degrees. And this angle is actually the difference between 30, 31, 31 and 15 degrees because they need it. Well, this angle right here is 180 minus 31. And then, yeah, that'd be 31 minus 15. So I'd be smaller than 46. That's not the right answer. So the answer is actually going to be 46, like, like we saw in the first case. But it's cool to consider like all the cases that are possible here. And I think that's the answer. Let's check. I mean, I already looked at it before, but let's check again. Okay, yep, it's 46 degrees. Great. Yep, great job. Um, this is another diagram of it with like less explanation, but it's okay because Leo explained it fantastically. All right, our next question is question 24 with this um wonky kind of grid thing got going on. The question that this thing is asking us is if we have this grid of numbers, Yang wants to sort of change some of these numbers so that the sum of the columns and the sum of the rows are all equal to the same thing. So it's kind of like a magic square, except less magic because the diagonals are don't have to be equal as well. This is say this claims that one possibility is that Yang could change every entry into the number nine, which obviously would work because if everything is nine, then the sum of everything, each row and column is twenty-seven. However, that's not the best way. Because that, because that requires changing nine values, and Yang could actually do it with changing less values. So how do we do this? 
One way we can look at it is try to find a minimum sort of value that sort of is possible before we look into how to actually get that minimum value. What I mean by that is like clearly let's let's draw in the sums of each of these rows and columns first. So the first row is going to give you 16. This is 12 and this is 17. This row this column is 10. Um this one is 15 and this one is 20. All right. So if we look at this diagram Notice that if you change only one number, then only two, two of the rows and columns are going to be changed, right? So for example, if you change this three to like a five, then this is changed to a sum of 12 and this one will be changed to 19. So since all of these sums of the rows and columns are different, you can't really get them all to be the same just by changing two of the rows and columns. So one does not work. It's sort of the same idea for two as well, because if you change two numbers, like say you change this number and this number, then you get to change one, two, one, two, three, four co columns and rows. And notice that since there's six different numbers here, we have to change at least five numbers. So that means that two also doesn't work. And I saw a lot of people guessing four and one person guessing, guessing three. So great job, all of you guys, for those guesses. But actually, even though with, with three numbers, suddenly we can actually get every row and column to change, right? However, three numbers is still not quite enough because if you think about it, um, changing three numbers changes six, all six of them, however, or allows you to change all six of them. However, since all of these numbers are like completely different, you can't really get them all to be the same thing by changing three of the numbers, because if we just change three of the numbers, there must be sort of some two rows that can be, that are the same, because if they're the same, then they can be changed by the same amount to get something that's also still equal because that's the only way we would make it work with three numbers but sort of note since every number is different that's not possible so three also does not work what about four so with four numbers there's like so many numbers that it's really hard to kind of get a grasp on whether it's possible or not using like the logic that we use to cancel out one, two, and three. So let's just like try to come up with an example that might work. Um, are you guys all okay with me moving on to the next uh, and emptier slide? Okay, great. I will move on to an empty slide. Um, so the idea is that, let me add in the sums again. Uh, 15... 20, 17, 12, and 16. Um, the idea is if we've got four numbers that we want to change, and we want to sort of minimize the number of numbers we want to change, right? So let's just make all of these numbers try to, all of these sums, try to match one of the sums that are already there. And since 15 is like kind of close to the middle, Let's, let's use 15. All right, so let's. So how would we get everything to equal 15? Notice that, yeah, so Via said at first I wanted to change it completely into the magic square, but I feel like um, that might be a bit difficult because there's just like so many numbers that are the same and not in the right place. Anyway, back to this example. So, if we want to change it to 15, notice that you have to make 10 and 12 bigger, right? So maybe we could try to add some number to these two columns, or sorry, to the intersection of these two columns and rows to add them to 15. Let's add 5 to 6. So if we add 5 to 6, then this becomes 11, and this one becomes, oh, let me make that a different color. This becomes 11, 
and then this becomes 15, and this one becomes 17. So now we want to make this one smaller. Um, we don't want to change this column because it's already 15 and that's nice. So let's make this one 17 minus 2 is 15. So 3 minus 2, let's make that 1. And then when you make that equal to 1, this 17 becomes equal to 15. So this one's, this row is happy now, as is this column. However, now that we change that one to 1, this one is equal to 18. So we want to bring this one down by 3. And we also want to bring this one, we want to bring this one down by 3, we want to bring this one down by 2, and we want to bring this one down by 1. Oh, how wonderful! 1 plus 2 is equal to 3, so we can just, you know, subtract 8 by 1 to make 7. And that gives us 15 over here. And 9 by 2, oops, 9 by 2 to make 7 as well, to make 15. And all of these added together makes 15. All right, so with that, we get a magic, oh, not a magic square, a square that's kind of magical, where every single row and column adds up to 15, which is exactly what we want. So the answer we would want is four. I hope this kind of walkthrough of how we got um, this new magic, this new square sort of is kind of intuitive, because I know that kind of, that coming up with, numbers that would fit each of these squares is kind of hard sometimes. But yeah. All right, let's move on to the next problem now. Yeah, great job, Sophie. Uh, next problem is 25, and this is the 20, from again, from the state's level sprint. The question is, what is the greatest two-digit prime factor of 300 factorial divided by 200 factorial divided by 100 factorial? Okay, so for this problem, it's pretty short. Um, and the trick here is that we notice that, um, like, if you we want a, the greatest two-digit prime factor. So it needs to be pretty big. So why don't we just try one to get a feel for this? Let's try 97, the biggest two-digit prime number. Well, 97, well, 300 has three 97s. Because 97 times 3 is less than 300, but 97 times 4 is greater than 300. But then 97 squared is way too large to be like, even part of 300, so it's just three 97s. But it turns out that 200, 200, well, let's call this factorial, has two 97s, and 100 has one 97. So 1 plus 2 is 3, and it has an equal number of 97s in the numerator and denominator. Unfortunately, that, that, that means that the greatest two-digit prime factor is not 97 because it's not in the this fraction. But... Instead of testing all the numbers, but all the primes with 97, why do we think of a faster way to do this? We want a value that goes into 300 more times than it goes into 200 and 100. In other words, it needs to leave a, re a, a big remainder for 200 and 100, but not 300. So, um, yeah. So, if you try, let's, uh, so basically, notice that you always have three like primes when they're between 76 and 76 and 99. By 76, and you take the floor of that. Well, the floor is just the greatest possible integer that is less than the um the the decimal. This is actually gonna be um 
is actually going to round down to three. And 99 also rounds down to three. But, and, the, and that means that, well, the same thing, well, 200 divided by 76, that goes to two and 99. And for 100, it goes to um, one. So this does not work. But notice that if X is less than 75, If it's less than 75, then for 300 factorial, it has four 75s. But 200 factorial only has, um, it has two, and then 100 factorial has one 75. So there's an extra 75 in 300 factorial. So basically, we can just try the biggest prime that's less than 75 or equal to 75. Turns out to be 73, which is our answer. Because 73, when you divide by 300, that gives you 4. But 200 and 100 combined give you only 3. So it should be 73. And I think a lot of you guys already said it was 73. So that's a great job, you guys, for doing that. Yay! Yeah. Yeah, that was a great solution. Honestly, my solution would have been a whole, a whole lot more hand wavy and would have been something along the lines of if you start at 97, then like that doesn't work. So you try go down and keep trying until you start feeling like tired of it. And then you like hop down a bit more and then you get 73, you know. So yeah, great job, Leo, for that excellent solution. All right, let's move on to the next one. Here we've got a frog named Freddy studying at the origin of a coordinate plane. In any given hop, he can hop exactly one unit up, down, left, or right. How many different locations can he land after his hundredth hop? So like, um, here's Freddy. I can't actually draw a frog, so pretend that's a frog. And the idea is that we want to know where he could be after his hundredth, hundredth hop. So maybe he could be out at like 100 comma zero or like, I don't know, 50 comma 50 or like, uh, maybe he could even have gotten back to where he started out at zero comma zero. I could totally just list out all of, no, don't list them out. It would be terrible. So how can we do this strategically without listing anything out? One way we can look at it is notice that any location you reach has to be sort of an even number. And what I mean by an even number is that the absolute value of like x plus y, that has to be equal to an even number. Because if you consider where this frog is hopping, the frog could either be, the, like the frog could hop to somewhere out over here, but in order to, like, anywhere he lands, it must sort of be even because the only way to get there is if he sort of goes back and then goes forward again. So if he backtracks and then unbacktracks or goes forward and then backtracks and, you know, that kind of thing, that's the only way he can get to any point. What I mean by that is, like, if he wants to get to 98, 0, he has to get to 98 comma zero and then maybe like jump forward and then back again or some sort of, you know, other way to rearrange that. So every location he ends up at has to have this sum be even. Otherwise, like if we let's let's say we do an example of. One comma zero. There's no way he can land on one comma zero because if he lands you, then, well, at any point when he lands on one comma zero, it must have been an odd turn. Sorry, an odd turn. So like maybe he hopped back and forth and back and forth and back and forth like 99 times. And then on the 99th turn, he's on the one comma zero point. But then on the hundredth hop, he can't get back to, you know, he can't just not move on the nine on the hundredth hop. So it has to be even. That's our first important insight. The second thing we want to consider is, well, just where even he could be. Honestly, at this point, we could just do casework. 
So we could say if x plus y is equal to zero, what would happen? Well, that means he's just at the origin, right? So if he's just at the origin, really, that's just the one point. If x plus y is equal to two, because remember, it has to be even, then he could either be at two comma zero, one comma one, zero comma two, or any other sort of positive or negative variation of that. What I mean is like this could be two comma zero or negative two comma zero and so on. So this first one has two options, this one has four options, this one has two options, which give us gives us eight options. Next up we've got if x plus y is equal to four. That could be four comma zero, one comma three, two comma two, Oh gosh, I don't think you guys want to watch me write all of this out. Anyway, so this one has two options, four, 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 two, which means this adds up to 16 ways. So we can keep doing this for a few more values, but basically what you're going to end up noticing is that for each of these positive absolute values, the answer is just going to be four times whatever the sum was equal to. So like, for example, x plus y equals 100. Since uh, he only gets 100 hops, that's going to be the biggest possibility. That one is going to give us 400 total ways. So our answer is actually going to be 1 plus 8 plus 6. Wait, was it 16? Yeah, 1 plus 8 plus 16 plus uh, 20. Sorry plus 24, plus dot, 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 plus 400. And then notice that this is just equal to 1 plus 8 times 1 plus 2, plus 3, plus dot, 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 plus 50. So this is, this is just the sum of the first 50 numbers, which we know is equal to um, 50 times 51 over 2. So our answer is going to be 1 plus 4 times 50 times 51. And this is equal to, while well, 4 times 50 is 200, times 51 is uh, 10200 plus 1, which is 10201. Yeah, I think. Yep. Yeah, great job again. That was a great explanation. Um, now we can move on to question seven, getting pretty late in the questions, I think. And it says, in the figure shown, quadrilateral PQRS, I mean, P, yeah, PQRS is inscribed in circle O. Given that QR is congruent to RS, SP equals six, uh, PQ equals two. What is the area of quadrilateral PQRS? So the first thing I notice here is we can we know that well RS and Q RQ are equal. And we also can draw in a couple of right triangles. Like here and and here. And because of this, and because O, I mean, SP passes through O, SP is the diameter of the circle. And both of these angles are right angles. Oh, I, a lot of people are saying you can split in the right triangles. That's great. Um, let's label RS, X, and our, our Q as X as well. Um, we know that SQ, we know that SQ equals... Um, the square root of 36 minus 4, or the square root of 32, or uh, 4 root 2. That is S cubed. And, hmm. In order to find the area, we need to also, hmm. I don't think what the best method of approaching this is. 
we can draw a hmm. well I think we could I don't but we could draw oh. an altitude from R to oh wait no never mind wait it might oh I see okay because Oh, I see now. Okay. Because um, SRQ has two equal sides and R, I mean, two equal legs, and R is a right angle, this means that X is just going to be equal to four. Do you guys, does everyone see that? Why? Is because it, it has the, it's the ratio of one, one, root two. And Why because of this. Uh Hold on, why is uh, R equal to a right angle? I think you oh, might be not. referring oops, to oops. the I think I, oops, I think I messed it up. Yeah, that's right. I drew it weirdly. Okay. Yeah, right, right. Uh, it's not. I saw, um, like, I have a solution that's basically, that has a bit of trick in it, so I'm not sure if you guys have learned that yet. I also saw the um, official solution, which was, like, um, something about kites. If that helps, because like um, they were referring to, they used this SRQO thing. They like found the area of this kite because the area of a kite is apparently the product of the diagonals or something like that. And then uh, also this area over here is like easy to find, I guess, because you know all the segments. Yeah, so S, as I was saying, like SQ is four root two, and huh, am I missing something? Okay, well, I mean, it's we can write RP here, our PR. RP is equal to the square root of 36 minus X squared. And then, I guess to find X, we could just use like, PR times Q SQ equals six X plus two X. But I think I don't think of it. I'm not can't think of a better solution right now. So let's just actually do that. Um okay, so we know that um PR times SQ equals um, six x plus two x because this this the this quadrilateral is cyclic, and then PR times SQ equals eight x, and this also equals the square root of thirty. Well, four root two times the square root of 36 minus x squared. And so that means that the square root of 36 minus x squared equals well, the square root of 36 minus x squared equals uh, root 2x, 2x squared Two x squared equals thirty six minus x squared equals two x squared. So x is equal to well thirty six out of three is twelve, and this is going to be the square root of twelve, which is equal to two root three. And if x is equal to two root three, this means that. We could find its um, area by dividing. Well, we can find. Wait. Huh. Wait a second. X is two or three here.
you could if you do the um kite method the idea behind that is like in order to figure out how to do do the area of a kite you just need the two diagonals and then wait. yeah wait how do you make a kite um by drawing oq oq and then, and then that's a kite because oh right yeah you're right yeah okay yeah equal. let me try that um yeah and those two are equal so then you would have the two diagonals and then um this diagonal is the radius so this one is three and then this diagonal i think you already got as root three two right yeah or root or two i should probably write and then you can find the area of the kite and the triangle right oh that's right that's right yeah okay so yeah um Wait, this is three, 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 um, two x x, and because this is a kite, is this side length is three. That side. Wait, wait, is it this angle? So what? Wait, am I drawing the right diagonal? Is it, wait, OQ, right? Okay. Yeah, OQ. Okay. We didn't find RP. Because if we have SRQO as the kite, then we don't really need um QP. Like, we just need to find what QPO is. And that's a triangle with a sighting of two, three, and three. Wait, I don't know what SQ is though. But you already found that. Oh wait, you're right, you're right. Oops, okay. Oh wait, 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 okay. I'm actually okay, yeah. I see, I see, I see. Okay, yeah. So okay, so uh O R O is three, and then SQ is four root two. So yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying now. Okay, um, so it would be, four, four times, four root two times three over two, which is the area of this kite right here. And you're adding that to the that triangle, which is a three by three by two triangle. So that would be, um one half times um one times square root of eight which is two root two and this equals um yeah six square root of two Plus, wait, you don't have to do one half actually. Yeah, it should be one half times two times two root two, and then plus two root two. So it should be eight square root of two. I think that's the right answer. But that was a big loophole, but not loophole, but like big. I made, I made a big mistake in the beginning, but I think it should be the right now. Yep, it's eight root two. Great. Yay. Um, I did see it, like, the other method I did it with, with the trigonometry thing was I split it into three triangles, because, like, the first thing I always think of when I have triangles with, I mean, sorry, when I have circles is just to draw the, as many radii as I can. So I drew these three, well, these two lines, and then once you have that, I said, oh, hold on. I, uh, okay, yeah. Once you have that, let's call SOR equal to theta, for example, and ROQ equal to theta as well, because um, we know that these are both going to be the same triangle. These are going to be congruent triangles because they're the radius 
they both have the radius and the side length as the triangle sides. And then once you have that, uh, let's say we draw this dot, this line down the middle. Well, yeah, let's say we draw this line down the middle because this uh, height here, mostly because I know stuff about QP, but that's mostly stuff based on right triangles ideas. So once you have this um, line down here, let's call this angle on the bottom equal to alpha. So like the this small angle in this um, right triangle. So if this is alpha, then notice that um, theta plus theta plus, oops, theta plus theta plus alpha plus alpha is equal to two theta plus two alpha. And then this is going to be equal to 180. So then we can say theta plus alpha is equal to 90, which means that this angle down here is actually equal to theta. Um, okay, let's go back to um, this stuff. So we want to find the area of SRO, ROQ, and QOP. Actually, I probably went a bit out of order with my rationale just now. So in order to find, yeah, in order to find the area of this shape, you have to find the, or one way you could do it is find the area of each of, the, each of these triangles. So initially I drew that line to get like the area of this small triangle down here. And then I noticed that theta was equal to uh, 90 minus alpha. And then if you look at, if you look at each of these triangles, um, one way to find the area of a triangle is to use this formula. The area is equal to one half AB sine C. I don't know if you guys have seen this before. Um, basically what this just says is if this is A, this is B, and this angle down here is C, the area is these two side lengths multiplied together times like the sine divided by two. Yeah. Um, Sophia asked what's sine. Sine is basically the the like opposite length divided by the hypotenuse in a right triangle. So like if you have this angle equal to theta, sine is equal to this length divided by this length. Um, technically we could actually explain this method without using sine as well. I'll, I'll do that instead. So basically the idea is if you have um, a triangle like this where the angle down there is theta, let me move that for now, then um, the area is the is one of the bases, hold on, no, I did it wrong. I, yeah, I did it wrong, oops. If you have um, a vertical line like this and this angle is theta, then the idea is that the area is going to be equal to the base times the height, right? So, sorry, one half times the base times the height. And notice that on um, the height, since this angle is theta, the ratio between um, the height and the side is going to be the same as this height and this side. So uh, let's call that F1 and this F2. What I mean is our F1 over um, our O, oops, our O is going to be equal to uh, OF2 divided by OP because of similar triangles. Because, um, yeah, because this angle is theta and that angle is also theta and it's right triangles. So knowing that, we can say that one half base times height is just equal to one half times SO times um, this RFI is just going to be equal to RO times this thing. So actually, let me move that a bit. So it's not on my face and you guys can probably see it better. Uh, hold on. You guys don't need this anymore. Okay. Let me move this down here. So that means that the base is SO and then the height is RFI, which is RO times OF2 
divided by uh, OP. For those of you who know this, this thing, um, this whole equation it just means one half AB sine C. Okay, so then this is equal to one half times SO is three, times RO is also three, um, times OF2 over OP, which is this height, which I think we figured out was root eight divided by three. And then this is equal to uh, like root two or something. So this is root two, that is root two, sorry, three root two. So this is three root two, that is three root two, and then we got like, this was two root two or something, so our answer would be eight root two. Um, yeah, I honestly think this solution is good if you already know, you know, one half AB sine C. If you don't know this, then um, this, this is like, a rather unintuitive way of doing it, and I think the kite way would have been better. Yeah. Also, the stars are not post counters. The stars are just like, um, if you make a good post and we like it, then we will star it, and then like you'll have a bunch of stars. Yeah. Okay, let's move on from this problem. The interesting thing about geometry is that um, every geometry problem has a lot of ways of doing it because the diagrams are just so easy to mess around with. Okay, problem 28. Suppose x and y are real numbers for which 2xy plus 16 equals x squared and 2xy plus 9 is equal to 4y squared. If y is greater than 0, what is x plus y equal to? So like, one thing we could do for this problem is, since there's 2xy in both of these, and I don't really like how this looks, let's just like subtract them away and see what happens from there. So I subtract this. If we subtract it, then we get um, 16 minus 9 is 7 is equal to x squared minus 4y squared is equal to, we can actually factor that using difference of squares to make x minus 2, sorry, x minus 2y times x plus 2y. All right. Ooh, and then Alice gave us, is giving a great idea to add these as well. Sure, because I really don't want to um, deal with either of these equations on their own. So when we add them, what we end up getting is uh, 4xy plus 25 is equal to x squared plus, oops, x squared plus 4y squared. Well, looking at this equation, it doesn't really look like we can do much with it, but actually, notice that if you move 4xy to the other side, maybe it's actually kind of nice, because then you have 25 is equal to x squared minus 4xy plus 4y squared, and then like, this is, I think this is actually a square because this is equal to x minus 2y squared. You can look at that and verify, um, but this should be true. And that's very nice because 25 is also squared, which means that I'm going to scroll down to it so you guys can't see the question anymore. So ask me if you need a reminder of what it is, by the way. Anyway, so that means that plus minus five is equal to x minus 2y. Hmm. Notice, notice that these two are actually exactly the same thing. So instead of saying 7 is equal to this um, product of things, we can say this is just equal to plus minus 5 multiplied by x plus 2y. So now we just have sort of two cases to solve for. If it's plus 5, then you've got 7 over 5, 7 over, if you have plus 5, then you've got 7 over 5 is equal to x plus 2y, and x minus 2y is equal to plus 5, which means that we would have a value of, a negative value for y, right? Because in order to get what y is equal to, you would subtract these two. 
and then you would get 4y is equal to 7 fifths minus 5, which is obviously negative. And we, since we want y to be positive, um, yeah, over here, we want y to be positive, so that means this is not the right solution. However, if we have negative 5, then what we have is 7 over 5 is equal to, negative 7 over 5 is equal to x plus 2y, and negative 5 is equal to x minus 2y. So when you subtract these two equations, you get 4y is equal to negative 7 fifth minus negative 5, which is, um, dang it, now I have to actually do this. This is going to be 5 minus 7 fifths, which is equal to 25 minus 7 is 18 over 5. So we've got 18 over 5 equals 4y, which means y is equal to 9 over 10. Um, yeah, and then we can solve for x using, honestly, any of these equations to get, let's say, negative 5 equals x minus 2y, which means um, x is equal to negative 5 plus 9 over 5. Negative 5. Actually, let's just add these two equations. Mm -hmm. No, I don't really want to add those either. Okay, so x is equal to negative 5 plus 9 over 5, which is equal to negative 25 plus 9 over 5 is like negative 16 over 5, which means that x plus y is equal to these two added together, which is negative uh, 23 over 10 or something like that. Oh no, did I add wrong? Oh, no, I did not. Okay, negative 2.3. I feel like I added this wrong, honestly. No. Uh. Oh yeah, Jaden said, why can't you just use x plus 2y equals 5? Um, yeah, let's do that. So we can also just do negative 7 fifths minus 9 tenths. Um, negative 7 fifths minus 9 tenths, which would be negative 14 over 10 minus 9 over 10. Yeah, which is negative 20, negative 2.3. Okay, I don't think I added wrong then. Awesome, I did not add wrong. Okay. Yeah, great job. Um, on second to last question of the sprint round 29 what integer is closest to the value of the, this expression right here so what i want to do here is probably some variables to make the math a little easier and why don't we call a to be equal to 3 plus square root of 12 and b to be equal to the fourth root of 1728 why do I think 178 looks kind of familiar? I'm not sure why, but um, so this would turn to be the square root of a plus b might plus oh 178 equals 12 cubed. That's nice. A plus b um plus the square root of a minus b to the fourth power. Then we can expand this. So this becomes um, a squared plus 2ab plus b squared plus, um, hmm, four. Well, we have a square root of a plus b to the power of four, which is just a plus b squared. And we add four times, um, a plus b. B. So that's four times a plus b cubed times a minus b plus ah uh, well that would be four choose two which is six times the square root of wait not actually not square root just a plus b times a minus b plus then 4 times a minus b times square root of a plus b square root of a minus b and you're and you're adding 
a squared plus, I mean, minus 2ab plus b squared. So it's a very long expression here. Moving on, we then can cancel out some things here, I think. So we can first cancel out the minus 2a plus 2ab minus 2ab. And we also can just simplify some things. So it's going to be a squared plus b squared plus 4 I think you uh, might so, be muted. Oh, never mind. Yeah, I'm back. Sorry. Um, so here um, is going to be a plus b. Wait, well, not. Yeah. a squared plus b squared plus four times um, a plus b times the square root of a squared minus b squared because the square root of a plus b times the square root of a minus b is the square root of a squared minus b squared plus 6a squared minus 6b squared. Ah, uh, adding so many things. <laughs> then plus 4 times a minus b times the square root of a squared minus b squared. Then adding a squared plus b squared again. Then we can do more simplification. And we get... Um... Let's see, a a squared, because a plus a squared plus six a squared plus a squared is eight a squared minus four b squared plus four, well, technically a a times square root of a squared minus b squared. Yeah, so I think that's simplified. So that means to check what a and b actually are and evaluate that. Um, let me just go back up to see what it was. A was 3 plus root 12. So 8 times 3 plus square root of 12 squared minus 4 times the fourth root of 1728 squared. Yeah, plus 8 times 3 plus square root of 12 times times um the square root of um three plus root twelve squared uh, so I'm actually gonna write this in the bottom because it's getting too big three plus root twelve plus times the square root of uh, three plus root. Oh my goodness. Three plus root twelve squared minus the square root of one is seven two eight. Okay. So now I think, huh? It's a good way to do this. I guess we can ex wait a second. Hmm. I mean, presumably, if you expand it out, like the square root of seventeen twenty eight will become like a a twelve root seventeen twenty eight. I mean, sorry, twelve root twelve. And then hopefully that'll cancel with. Oh yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. Um. Yeah. Okay. So I think we can first focus on this part. And so, three plus root twelve squared is going to be nine plus twelve. Um. Well, because nine three squared is nine. Twelve squared is root twelve squared is twelve, and they're actually going to add twelve root twelve. And subtract 12 root 12, as Sophie was saying. And we can cancel these. So this becomes, I think, uh, 8, 
3 plus root 12 squared plus 4 times is 12 that, root. So am I doing it wrong or is that 12 root? Is, what? Isn't it plus 6 root 12? Oh, wait. You're right. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> because, I don't know, I feel like if it cancelled out so neatly, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. 6 root 12, yep. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so it would be, wait, yeah, 8 times 3 plus root, root 12 times square root of um, 21 minus 6 root 12. Oh, I see now. Okay. And the square root of 21 minus 6 root 12 is going to be, it should be uh, 3 minus root 12 because 3 squared is 9, root 12 squared is 12. Add that 21 and you subtract, you get 3 minus root 12. Or it should be 12 minus root 3. Um, I think it should be 12 minus root 3 then. I mean, no, no. I mean, root 12 minus 3. Because it should be the positive root. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then we add to this... Um, 8 times... 3 plus root 12 times 3 plus root 12. We add to this. Um, well, 4 times 4th root of 1728 would be, well, that squared would be 12 root 12. So minus 48 root 12. And then... This equals um yeah, I think the okay, so well this stuff adds to the minus three and plus three cancel, so this adds to two root twelve. And then so this adds all the way to sixteen times so forty eight. Wait, no. Two root twelve. That would be forty eight minus forty eight root twelve plus wait, so twenty four plus twenty four is forty eight. Subtracting forty eight root twelve here, and then you're gonna add um uh sixteen thirty two root If I'm doing everything correctly, let's see. So, two at twelve. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this should be forty-eight minus sixteen root twelve, which is forty-eight minus sixteen. Well, no. Nah. 40 minus, well, root 12 is wait. 3, wait, 2 root Hold 3. On. I thought some things cancel. some of the root 12s canceled out, right? Wait, where? Hold on, I think I might, I might be lost. Which part are you working on exactly? Oh, I'm just simplifying the, um, like, I was right here, right? Mm -hmm. I was, um, I had, 
like right here, eight plus three root 12 squared minus four, fourth root of 17, 28 squared, and then adding the eight stuff. And I was just simplifying that. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. I'm pretty sure this is right, but I feel like something might cancel. I might, might, I might have mistake mistake somewhere. Where did the yeah. 32 root 12 come from? I mean, because. Oh, wait, I think it messed up. Wait, no. Wait, let me try again. I think it messed up somewhere. Okay, wait. Oh, wait. Um. Oh, wait, yeah, it does cancel. You're right. Okay. Okay, so this becomes 16, 3 plus root 12 times 2 root 12 minus 48 root 12. And then, oh yeah, this is 48 root 12. Wait, what? Oh, wait, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Huh. Hmm. Okay, wait. So 2 root 12, 16 root 3 plus root 12 minus 40 root 12. Why am I getting, why, why is not everything canceling? 48 times 2. Which part isn't canceling? Twelve. I mean, like the four, the root twelve is not canceling away. It should, right? Because the eight a squared. What did you get for the eight a squared? Can you scroll down? I can't really read it through the. Uh, okay, the me show up. No, I'm down. Down. Because I can't really see. Yeah. Um. 16. I don't know, because I get 8 times 21 plus 6 root 12, and then that becomes 48 root 12, right? And then it cancels out. Wait, where are you getting that? The 3 plus root 12 squared gets a, becomes um, 21 plus 6 root 12. Yeah. And then, and then that multiplies out to 8 times 21 plus 48 root 12 minus 48 root 12 because this one was 48 root 12. Yeah, right? Yeah. And then, so that should give just 8 times 21, which is like 168. And then what did you get for the uh, for the 8a times square root of 8 squared minus b squared part. Oh, that was like minus 48 root 12. This one was minus 48 root 12. I mean, no. What was, was this one? Which one? The 8a times square root of a squared minus b squared. I agree, this is very confusing. Oh, that was just the um, that was just eight times three plus root twelve times 12, root twelve minus three. Yeah, so that's twenty four, right? So that shouldn't that just give one sixty eight plus twenty four? Yeah, it should yeah. Okay. Bro. Well, okay. So that should be. Oh, wait, you're right, okay. Yeah, so 168, wait. So 12 minus 9, 3, 24. Yeah, 24 plus. And what is this? Two. Okay, I think it's 192. 
Okay. Yeah. Hopefully. Um, I agree that is ve it's very bashy. So let's let's just do a quick run because it, it was like just a rather all over the place problem. We can't use a calculator because it's sprint, sadly. So I'll start from the beginning and go through it another time. We started with this three plus root twelve, um, plus fourth root of seventeen twenty eight plus you know this whole thing. I'm not going to read it out loud. And then we set this three plus root twelve as a, and the fourth root of seventeen twenty eight as b. So this was a, this was b, and then you basically this value just becomes the square root of a plus b plus the square root of a minus b to the fourth power. Calculators are allowed in the target round and in the team round, but not in the sprint round and not on countdown. Anyway, so back to this problem. Um, when you have the square root of a plus b plus the square root of a minus b, you can expand it out using the binomial, but binomial formula, which is what Leo did. You can also expand it out by squaring it twice, which I think someone mentioned in the chat like um, a bajillion years ago when we, when we first got started on this problem. Um, here's like a sort of reduce or like um, reduced way of doing it or neat way, not neat. Um, here's the way you would do it by squaring both sides. I mean, squaring it twice given that I got rid of all the scratch word. Anyway, yeah, and then you would get a, a squared minus 4b squared plus 8a times square root of a squared minus b squared, like we got before. And then down here, you've got, you plug it into these numbers, this thing down here, or if we look at the top two terms, the first term becomes this 8 times 21 plus 6 root 12, and then you subtract, and then the where the 1728 is 12 root 12, sorry, 12 cubed. So the square of that becomes 12 root 12, and then this is 48 root 12. So that gives you 168. And down here, you've got 8 times 3 plus root 12 times like this thing. This thing on the inside simplified to root 12 minus 3, which Leo showed you down there, which means that was 24. All right. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Jaden. Uh, which which part of this question or that explanation was the most confusing, I guess? Um, all right. As you, I guess as you think about that, I will move on to the next problem and we can come back to this problem after, <laughs> after we finish the next one. Yeah, I know it's a very confusing and bashy problem. I'm very sorry. It's, it's all confusing. We can run through it another time again once we finish the last problem. But I want to move on just in case anyone else, anyone wants to look at the 30th problem. But we will definitely come back to 29 if you guys want. Okay, the volume of a regular dodecahedron of edge length 1 is 15 plus 7 root 5 over 4 root. And the volume of a regular icosahedron is 15 plus 5 root 5 over 12. Um, okay. So a solid metal icosahedron of edge length 2 is melted down, divided, and used to form two solid shapes. <laughs> what is this? It's a terrible word problem. A terribly long word problem and a cube of edge length b cube, cube root of b. If a and b are both rational numbers, what is the value of a plus b? So I think you guys are asking questions about what dodecahedron and icosahedrons are. Honestly, the thing is that it doesn't actually really matter what these shapes are, because honestly, this this is just trying to confuse you with like a red herring and like a lot of words. It's just trying to confuse you. The only thing you really need to know for this problem is like what's going on here. So what happens is you have something, some sort of icosahedron with edge length 2, and you make it into a dodecahedron with edge length a cube, cube root of a, and a cube, oh, I can actually draw a cube, <laughs> with edge length uh, cube root of b. So then what you do with all of this stuff 
is somehow like you can melt down the icosahedron to make these two shapes. So that means that the volume of the icosahedron is equal to the volume of these two things added together. So if we plug that, so if we know that the volume of a regular icosahedron is of edge length one is this thing, the volume of a regular icosahedron of edge length two is just going to be eight times that because we're in 3D space. So when we um, increase the 1D thing by two or by a factor of two, the volume, the 3D thing is going to increase by two cubed, which is eight in this case. So that means the volume of the icosahedron is equal to 8 times 15 plus 5 root 5 divided by 12. And then this is going to be equal to the volume of the dodecahedron, which is this 15 plus 7 root 5 over 4, multiplied by r, uh, like the cube root of a cubed, which is just equal to a because we're use, using the same process that got us eight here, basically because the uh, the side length increased by a factor of a cube root of a, the volume is going to increase by this thing cube, which is a. Okay, so then the cube is going to have an area of just b because the, the side length was cube root of b. So really none of this stuff really matters anymore and we're just trying to solve, we just want to know this information. Um, yeah. Okay. We also know that apparently um, the value of a and b are rational numbers. So that's the other thing that we need to know. Okay. So now all we have to do is we have to solve this equation. 8 times like 15 plus 5 root 5 over 12 equals 15 plus 7 root 5 over 4 times a plus b is equal to like, yeah, these two things are equal and we know that a and b are rational. It might seem like um, they don't, this is like impossible to do because there's only one equation and two variables, but this a and b being rational part is very important because if you simplify both sides of the equation, this becomes um, 30 plus 10 root 5, sorry, 30 plus 10 root 5 over 3. And yeah, that's it. Well, you can say like this is 15a plus 7 root 5a over 4 plus b. So now that you have these two pieces of information, you know that you can sort of set the rational parts equal to each other and the non-rational parts equal to each other because a and b are rational so what i mean by like the coefficients of root 5 and the coefficients of not root 5. so that means that 30 over 3 is going to equal 15 a over 4 over 4 plus b and 10 is going to equal to 7 a over 4. oops well, i'll write 10 root 5 is equal to 7 root 5 a over 4. Because since a and b are rational, the rational parts of this equation are going to be equal to the rational parts, the irrational parts are going to equal the irrational parts. So you've got this sort of situation going on here. Um, we can just get rid of the root 5 here. So all we're working with here is 10, oops, 10 is equal to 7a over 4. And now we've actually got two equations and two variables. So a is going to be equal to 40 over 7. And then this is equal to plug 40 over 7 back into here. You've got 10 over 7 times 15 is 1. Hold on. Oh, oops. I forgot to divide the 10 root 5 over 3. So this should be 10 over 3 equals 7a over 4. 7a over 4 because this was 10 over 3 up here. Okay, which means that A would be equal to 20, 40 over 21, actually. So A equals 40 over 21, and then when we look up here, that becomes 15 over 4 times 40 over 21 plus B, which is equal to um, 4 and 40 cancel out to make 150 over 21. Hold on, let me just 
cancel out properly. So this is 10, that cancels. This is 7, that cancels to 5, sorry. So the top you get, so this gets 50 over 7 plus B. And then that means B is equal to 50 over 7 minus 30 over 3 equals 10. So 50 over 7 minus 10, which is, uh, sorry, the other way around. 10 minus 50 over 7, which is equal to 20 over 7. Awesome. And then, yeah, we want to find A plus B. So we've got 40 over 21 plus 20 over 7 is equal to 100 over 21. So this is the real answer I should be circling. Don't, don't answer 20 over 7 in the actual test. Okay, yeah. So honestly, this problem... It's hard because it looks confusing and it looks terrible, but if you ignore all of the confusing words and like icosahedron, dodecahedron, all of this stuff, then it becomes like a much more doable problem. Yeah. Um, all right. With that, we've gone through all of the problems and you guys like can leave now. But we will also go back to number 29 to like re-explain it if you want. Well, even if you don't want, because I want to be re ex I don't know. Explaining it the second time after we figured it out should be a lot easier because um we already sort of know how to go about it, but we also know how not to go about it. So it'll be easier, hopefully. And hopefully that means it'll be more understandable. Before we do that, though, does anyone have any other questions about all of the other stuff we talked about today? All right, I will go back to the previous problem then. And just like text, text in any and all questions that you have when, when you think of them, even if you're like interrupting me mid explanation. Okay, let me just, uh, I don't know, make a copy of this screen. Okay. Oops. Um, let's run through this one more time. All right. So when we've got the square root, all right, see, Sophia. When you've got a plus b plus a minus b to the fourth power, honestly, I'm just going to be reiterating what Leo said. So if you guys have anything really important you need to do, feel very free to just go ahead and go. When you square this, this becomes this thing squared is a plus b. This thing squared is a minus b. And then multiply and then we've got two times the square root of a plus b times a minus b and then everything squared obviously this looks very messy but there's a lot of things that can be cancelled out b and b cancel out to make 2a and then this thing over here is just difference of squares so that becomes 2 root a squared minus b squared squared and then this is equal to this thing squared is 4a squared. This thing squared is 4 times a squared minus b squared. So 4 times a squared minus b squared. Or we can also write that as just 4a squared minus 4b squared. And then when you multiply these together and do 2ab, that becomes 2 times 2a times 2 root a squared minus b squared. So simplifying, that becomes 4a squared um, plus 4a squared becomes 8a squared minus 4b squared plus 8a root a squared minus b squared. All right. And then now that we have that, bye, Gathen. Um, sorry, sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Now that we have that, we can plug in a and b into this expression. So this is equal to 8 times 3 plus root 12 squared 
minus four times uh, the fourth root of seventeen twenty-eight squared, and then I'll just write plus eight a squared of a squared minus b squared because I don't want to write that out. Okay, so this thing is equal to eight times nine plus twelve is twenty-one, and then plus two a b is two times three times root twelve is plus six root twelve, and this is equal to uh one hundred sixty-eight plus forty-eight root twelve. This part is going to be equal to minus four times um, the fourth root of 1728 is the fourth root of 12 cubed. So this is like the square root of 12 cubed, which is equal to negative four times 12 root 12, which is negative 48 root 12. All right, and then this final part is going to be equal to that. That's like the most difficult part to simplify. Is going to be equal to eight times three plus root twelve times the square root of three plus root twelve squared is going. Well, I'll write it out first. So three plus root twelve squared minus uh, the fourth root of 1728 squared. This is going to be equal to 8 times um, 3 plus root 12 times 3 plus root 12 squared is going to be equal to, let's see, let me stop drawing on my face, 9 plus 12 is 21 plus six root 12, we calculated this earlier. And the 14, the 1728 to the fourth root and then squared, we calculated that here as well, is equal to 12 root 12. So minus 12 root 12. This is equal to eight times three plus root 12 times the square root of 21 minus six root 12. Honestly, I would not have noticed this if Leo had not pointed it out, but 21 minus 6 root 12 is actually equal to the square of root 12 minus 3, because notice that 12, this squared is 12 and this squared is 9, which add up to 21 and multiply together, minus 2ab makes uh, minus 6 root 12. Yeah, so then this product is 8 times 3 plus root 12 times 12 minus root 3, which is equal to 8 times 3, which is 24. Which means that all in all, our answer is going to be equal to, um, let me combine this all together, this 168 plus 48 root 12 minus 48 root 12 uh, plus 24. which means our answer is going to be equal to um, these two terms cancel out, which gives us 192. The way I got square root of 12 minus 3 from, oh, from here, yeah, is basically, so when you look at 21 minus 6 root 12, basically, uh, if it's, if if there's a square root inside of a square root, one of the things we like to try to do is see if we can like make this into some sort of square and then like it would become nicer, right? So the way usually we have that make this equal to a square is if it's equal to a squared plus b squared plus 2ab for some, or well in this case it would be minus 2ab because that's minus sign, for some a and b. Since there's a square root of 12 in here, um, or oh, since there's this like irrational term, we usually want to try to make like 6 root 12 equal to this 2ab. So like the first thing you could try to guess is since 6 root 12 is equal to 2 times 3 root 12, right? The first thing you could try to do is just set one of them equal to, one of these two values equal to 3, one of them equal to root 12. 
So for example, if a is 3, b is root 12, then what this becomes is 9 plus 12 minus 2 times 3 times 12, which happens to be equal to this 21 minus 6 root 12 we have here. So basically, it's just a guess and check process. Um, if like setting 3 and root 12 hadn't worked, we might have tried like maybe 1 and 3 root 12. Or we could have also tried since root 12 is equal to 2 root 3, we could also have tried like maybe 2 and uh, 3 root 3 or something like that. Yeah, it's like easy. Uh, Lanny says it's easier if you just set both parentheses things as a and b and find a squared and b plus b squared and also a b and then you can find a plus b squared. And yeah, thanks, Lanny. I think I agree with you. Um, but oh, yeah. the binomial theorem is also just as well. Okay. I just realized that like when we have before the twenty one minus six square root of twelve and you take the square root of that. Like, um, we could have just like kept, um, wait, 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 wait. could have just kept, like, so like we could have the square root of three squared plus, um, like square root of 12 squared minus two times three times square root of 12. And then that would just be a squared plus b squared minus 2ab. And then we just simplify that. I, I didn't realize that before, but. Yeah, it's all right. All right, so I will just show you guys all of these, this entire thing on one screen real quick. Um, okay, hopefully you can actually still read it because it became a bit thick, but yeah. Um. The general idea here is just try to try things out and you'll probably eventually simplify. Yeah. Did that help make this problem make a bit more sense and like make it less confusing? Hopefully. Just yet another run through of it. All right. I am glad. Mm. Okay, do you guys have any other questions? <laughs> Are these solutions released yet? I think so. Um, I'm not sure if it's on the website, but I think they probably released somewhere. Thank you, Kiki. See ya. See you, Jaden. Thank you at thanks seven. See you. Oh, probably not. Anyway, see you, Lenny.